Hello, this is Pastor Nick Hood. We'll be starting worship in just a moment. And let me tell you what I'm preaching about today. I'm preaching a sermon entitled, The Name Dropper, The Name Maker, and The Salt of the Earth. And I want you to ask yourself, do I fall in any of these categories? The Name Dropper, The Name Maker, and The Salt of the Earth. The text is taken from the book of Revelation, chapter 3, where Jesus says, uh, I wish that you were either hot or cold, but because you're neither hot nor cold, I will spew you from my mouth. And what Jesus is really talking about is authenticity. Am I a real person uh, or am I a fake? Uh, and that's what I'm preaching about. Uh, and how the people who really change the world are the authentic people. Uh, so I want you to think about it. Call a friend, call a family member. And let them know worship at the Plymouth United Church of Christ is about to begin. God bless. God keep you. This is Pastor Nick Hood.
Welcome to the Plymouth United Church of Christ, located in the heart of Detroit, the very tip-top of the medical center area of Detroit. We are praising God this day. Search me, O Lord, and know my heart. Try me, know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me, then lead me in the path everlasting, because this is the day that the Lord hath made. Welcome to the Plymouth United Church of Christ. I'd like to present to us this day the Gospel Choir under the direction of Lamar Willis. And let me just say that uh, we have a special anniversary. Patricia and Walter Willis are celebrating 44 years of marriage. Uh, why don't you raise your hands, amen? All right. I was teasing Patricia this morning. I said, you know, it's one thing to make it to 44 years. I said, but you're still speaking. <laughs> so I'm very happy for them. The Plymouth United Church of Christ Gospel Choir.
all right with me. Amen. I don't know if anybody looking at this worship service can say that uh, in an affirmative way. He's all right. He's all right. He's all right with me. Today, I want to talk about three kinds of people. My wife always gets on me. She says, you know, Nick, you're practicing psychology without a license. I said, Denise, I'm a black preacher. <laughs> I said, that's what the black preacher does all the time. We are practicing psychology often without a license. But today I want to talk about three personality types. And I would certainly not want to be the one to say that these are the only three personality types. But as I have lived my life, I've found that there are three kinds of people, and two of them get on my nerves. One is called the name dropper. The name dropper. This is the person who uh, you can't have a conversation with them without them dropping somebody else's name. I don't know if anybody looking at this has ever met a name dropper. Uh, they want to tell you who they know, who they met, what book they've read. Um, you know, and then people who just don't want to name drop, sometimes what they do is they post drop. You say, what is that? You know, but on Instagram or Facebook, uh, any of the social media, they could even do it on LinkedIn. They can try to fi figure out a way. But people will post on Facebook and Instagram pictures of themselves, uh, information about themselves that they want you to know about. Uh, because in their mind, they feel as if it presents them in the best light. And that may or may not be the case. But uh, that's the name dropper. Then there's the name maker. The name maker is a person who goes out of their way to make a name for themselves. Uh, and that can be positive, it could be negative. The name maker uh, sometimes is a mass murderer. They want a name for themselves. Uh, and, you know, I don't want to be unfair with this because in many cases, the name maker is a person who actually deserves uh, the acclaim that comes to them. But we have to ask ourselves, in our attempt to make a name for ourselves, uh, have we gone over the line? And then there's the third person. To me, the third one is called the salt of the earth. That's what Jesus called him in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, you are the salt of the earth. Now, Jesus goes on to say, but what good is salt if it's lost its savor? Uh, he said, we just have to throw it out. Uh, but you and I are the salt of the earth. And when I think of the salt of the earth, those are good people. Uh, those are people who are not necessarily looking for a claim. Sometimes the acclaim comes to them. In many cases, it does not. I think about the passengers who diverted the flight uh, and fought hijackers to their mutual death uh, and landing, crashing in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Those are salt of the earth people. Uh, they bought a plane ticket uh, thinking they were going one way and the plane gets diverted toward Washington, D.C. They're getting news that uh, buildings are being bombed, the trade center has been torn down, and these unlikely people look at one another and say, let's roll. Uh, and it's on. And they're duking it out to the death with hijackers preserving the Capitol and the White House in the United States. Uh, those are salt of the earth people. When I think of the people who pressured the state of Virginia uh, to take down, uh, you know, what was it? 40 foot pedestal and 25 foot statue on top of the pedestal, Robert E. Lee, the leader of the Confederate Army, uh, over, you know, monument 
Boulevard in, in uh, I think it's Richmond, Virginia. The people, the capital of Virginia, the people who took down that statue, now, I'm not talking about the workers who took it down, but the people who made it possible for that statue to come down are just salt of the earth people. We'll probably never hear the entirety of their names. Uh, but they knew it was right and knew it was wrong uh, for the state to, to, to honor not just a loser, but a seditionist. The person who is, you know, the leader of the sedition, the biggest sedition in the United States uh, prior to January 6th. And just good, plain, ordinary people who said, we're not going to take it anymore. They brought it down. They are the salt of the earth. When I think about the biggest trial in Silicon Valley, uh, you know, a name maker is Elizabeth Holmes. I don't know if any of you have been following this, but this lady built a uh, billion dollar company when she was 19. Uh, but the problem is that she overstated what the company really could do in terms of a simple blood test. And now she, her argument is, and you know, a jury of her peers will see if it's true, but her argument is, well, you know, businesses uh, make mistakes all the time. This is a business mistake. Uh, but the government is prosecuting her, saying this is more than a business mistake. You have made a name for yourself, you've made money for yourself, uh, but you have not delivered on what you promised. And so, very often, when I think about the name maker, you know, the name dropper, uh, and the salt of the earth, I think that sometimes the lines get blurred. But when I read the Bible, uh, I always find really a point of relevance. And when I think about this name maker, the name dropper, and the salt of the earth, I think about the word in the revelation of John. And the word in the revelation of John uh, is designed for just this. If you have your Bible nearby, flip to chapter 3 of the Revelation. And in chapter 3, starting at verse 14, uh, and I'm going to read some of it, and then I'm going to expound on it. But listen to what John says to the church at Laodicea. He says, and to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write the words of the amen, the faithful, the true witness, the origin of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. And uh, it goes on from there. But I really think that what John was communicating on behalf of God is that the people in Laodicea were not authentic. They were not authentic. And when I think about the name dropper, uh, the person who is fighting so hard to make a name for my, themselves, very often these are people who are not authentic. And what is an authentic person? Uh, Teddy Pendergrass says, just be for real. You know, just be for real. Don't be something that you're not. And in the case of the church at Laodicea, uh, they were not only not what they were and purported to be, but John said, you're lukewarm. You're not strong enough to take a position. And because you are not strong enough to take a position, God has no place for you. I wonder about how authentic people uh, can be if they don't take a position. I served for eight years on the Detroit City Council, and I always got red flags when, you know, back then everything was the committee of the whole. And in modern Detroit, current Detroit, we don't realize that the reason why we had a committee of the whole uh, in previous years was a self-correction to 1929. In 1929, the Detroit City Council had districts, just like we have now. And in 1929, the district setup got so, became so corrupt, the way the city of Detroit, you know, you had councilmen who went to jail, you had a mayor, I think, who went to jail, 
And so the self-correction for the Detroit City Council was to flip it from a district setup, which is prone to create fiefdoms, the committee chairs and the district setup uh, become very, very powerful people. Uh, but uh, I know my council president, Brenda Jones, is looking at this today because she just texted me right before we started worship. But uh, council president, am I right about this? And so the self-correction was a committee of the whole. Uh, and I, you know, I was elected at large uh, two times, eight years. And the committee of the whole setup is designed so that Every issue, every contract comes before the entire city council. It doesn't start off in a committee. It starts in front of everybody. And I used to get concerned when every now and then one of my colleagues, uh, when an issue would come before us, would raise a hand and say, I don't have a particular feeling about this. And I say, oh, Lord, what does that mean? I say, what does that mean when you say, well, I don't, I don't have a strong position on this. And I say, you need to get one. <laughs> you need to pray to the Lord and get a position. Uh, but that's what God is saying to the church at Laodicea. God is saying, take a position. You can be wrong, but at least have a feeling. And if you have a feeling... Uh, then that's a starting point. Uh, the l church at Laodicea was inauthentic because it could not say yes or no. And Jesus told them he, you know, in the Sermon on the Mount, many years before the revelation, in the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5 of Matthew, Jesus says, I would that your no would mean no and your yes would mean yes. But you know, my friends, truth can be stranger than fiction. Uh, the first part of my ministry was political, as I mentioned, the Detroit City Council. But in one of my elections, I was walking door to door uh, and in a campaign where I literally walked from Alter Road to Dexter, from Jefferson to Grand Boulevard. I want you to think about how far that is. I lost 20 pounds in that election. But uh, one day, I was going door to door. Uh, my father was on one street, uh, James Watts, who was my Sunday school teacher when I was a little boy, right here at the Plymouth United Church of Christ. Mr. Watts was on the other street. And uh, I crossed uh, Mount Elliott on a street called Pulford. I don't know anybody looking at this from the east side knows Pulford Street. And uh, I was going door to door on Pulford, and there, were, you know, there weren't hardly any people who were home. But there was this one house where I saw a group of men, African American men, and they were sitting on stumps. They were drink, drinking liquor, stumps and, and chairs, and they, many of them, looked like they had been to a funeral. They had on black suits and white shirts and dark ties. And they were just sitting out there having a slow burn, good time, uh, drinking that hot liquor. And so I'm saying to myself as I'm approaching this house, should I talk to these guys? Should I not? Uh, they're probably drinking. Uh, you know, it may be combative. But I came to the conclusion, I said, I have to talk to these guys. And so I, I walked up to them. I said, hi, my name's Nick Hood, and I'd like your vote. And one guy who had had his share of the liquor, he looked at me, and he said, young man, I want to know one thing. I said, yes, sir, what's that? He said, what I want to know is if I vote for you, and I can't say it the way he said it because this is a church, <laughs> and these are good church people looking at this. But the young man said, I mean, the old man looked at me and said, young man, I just want to know one thing. If I vote for you, can you make my hmm, hmm? In other words, can you take away my, uh, my erectile dysfunction? But he said it in a real crude way. <laughs> my hmm and my hmm. <laughs> and 
I just looked at him, and I wanted to fall out laughing. I said, I have heard it all. I said, all I'm asking for is your vote. You know, I didn't, I didn't ask for all that. And before I could answer, because I'm starting to fall out laughing, another old man got in between me and the guy who was talking. He said, young man, he said, I'm going to tell you the only thing I'm looking for in an elected official. And I said, what's that? He said that your yes mean yes and that your no mean no. That's a true story. I, you, I should write a book one day of the kind of things I've had to put up with as an elected official. <laughs> uh, and I encourage everybody looking at this, at, at least one point in your life, run for office. You know, you think you're so big and bad. Run for office and see if you can put up with the kind of foolishness that people bring to you. <laughs> uh, but to this day, I think about the second man. The second man who got up and said to the old man, you shouldn't talk to this young man like this. Um, you know, I got elected at 41. I'm just a little bit two years older than you, Lamar. And the point, and so I was technically a young man. But the point that I'm making is that uh, the second man's word to me sticks to me this day when he said, all I want is that your yes mean yes and your no mean no. And when he said that to me, bells went off in my head. I said, that guy, he's quoting Jesus Christ. Right out here in a field of drunken uh, stupor, this guy is quoting Christ. Uh, the book of Revelation, and, and before I go on, the point he was making about Jesus Christ was just be authentic. You know, you don't have to always be right, but at least be authentic in what you're doing. The book of Revelation is about the final battle between good and evil. And I know there's a lot of myth, uh, there's a lot of superstition in the book of Revelation, about the book of Revelation, but I want to break it down to, for you real quickly. Number one, the book of Revelation is written to seven specific churches. Uh, in that are exist they exist today in modern day Turkey, uh, and each of these seven churches, with the exception of Philadelphia, uh, the city of brotherly love, with the exception of Philadelphia, there is a critique, a criticism of every one of them, and I want to read some of these for you. This is from uh, chapters two, and chapters three of the book of Revelation. You have seven churches. The one I'm preaching on today is Laodicea. And before I read these words, because they're very critical of all of these churches except Philadelphia, is that God is preparing the seven churches for the final battle between good and evil. Now I know some of you have friends uh, in certain churches. Uh, they get fixated on the rapture. Have you ever have a friend or know somebody who just wants to beat you up about the rapture? Let me tell you what the rapture really is about. It, it's in Revelation. Uh, we see it in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15 uh, where Paul says, uh, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we shall all be changed uh, and the dead shall be raised imperishable. Uh, that's talking about the rapture. But really, where that rapture really is highlighted in the book of Revelation. And it's highlighted during the last battle between good and evil. And in the, the, the chapters and verses leading up to the last battle between, you know, the angels of God and Satan, the angels of God being led by Jesus Christ himself, uh, there are words uh, going back to around the 18th and 19th, of uh, chapter of Revelation that talks about how in the final battle you have Jesus, well one, you had the devil on one side, uh, but you have Jesus Christ on the other, and Jesus has an army made up of two kinds of people. On the one hand, the army of Jesus is made up of uh, uh, the conquerors. The conquerors are people who've been slain for their faith. 
And guess where the conquerors are coming from? Laodicea, Tyratira, Smyrna, Pergamum, uh, Philadelphia, uh, Sardis. That's where, uh, this is who the letter is written to. And what John is saying, if you want to read further about what I'm talking about, uh, Google a guy named Brian Blount. Uh, he's an African-American uh, president of a seminary, and I forget which one he's the president of on the East Coast. I heard him speak many years ago at Yale, of all places, in the uh, Lyman Beecher lecture series, and I ran out and bought his books. But one of the things that Blount talks about is how the army of Jesus is made up of two components. On the one hand, it is the conquerors, the dead in Christ, who will rise. On the other hand, it's the living dead. The living dead at Laodicea. The living dead at Tyratira. The living dead at Pergamon and Sardis. Uh, that is where, in Philadelphia, that's what he's talking about. And he's saying that there's a coalescence of the, uh, the, the dead dead, who are raptured uh, uh, to heaven, they are not just raptured to heaven to walk around saying how they do. Uh, they are raptured to fight on behalf of Jesus. I have never today heard a person who gets so hung up about being raptured uh, talk about how I'm going to be raptured so I can fight for Jesus. You know, if, if you really want to be raptured, the question ought to be, are you prepared to fight? And what John's revelation is doing is he's talking to the uh, dead dead and he's talking to the living dead. And he's saying, you have got to come together. And that's another sermon. One day I'm going to talk about the living dead. Uh, there's some people you and I know who are alive, but they are really dead. Uh, and that's kind of what John is saying to Laodicea. He says, I know your works. You're neither hot nor cold. Therefore, because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. I'm not going to read the seven words, but you can read them for yourself uh, the, the, to the seven churches. Go back to, you ought to read Revelation chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3. If you read those three chapters, you will see what the revelation is really about. Uh, and so the question that I want to pose for you today is this. How would you describe yourself? How would you describe yourself? Are you a name dropper? Are you a name maker? Uh, are you a name dropper, a name maker, or are you the salt of the earth? Do you beat yourself up because you're not famous? Do you beat yourself up because the whole world doesn't know your name? Or can you go to bed at night and feel good that you love your neighbor as you love yourself? Do you go to bed at night feeling good because you raised your children in a good way? Do you go to bed at night and feel good that you didn't take anybody's money? Do you feel good about yourself because of the way you've handled yourself? How would you describe yourself? And do you hide your feelings until you find out what other people think? Are you strong enough in your character to say yes when you feel yes and no when you feel no? Uh, or are you a person who just goes along uh, for the ride because you don't want to upset anybody? Every time I think about the issues of today, I'm reminded that the Bible is still relevant and real right now. And as you consider how you would like to present yourself, I want you to ask yourself this question. Am I a name dropper? Do I you know, only feel good when I can call out somebody else's name who I hardly even know? Uh, am I a name maker or am I the salt of the earth? Now, I want to say one more thing about the name dropper. One of the things I've learned about people who like to drop the name of somebody else is that very often those people are also hating on not necessarily the name dropper, but they're hating on people who are in their field of endeavor, whatever their endeavor is. They can't find anything good to say anybody else, but they want to tell you uh, 
whose name they want to drop. Are you a name maker? Uh, are you fixated on making a name for yourself? Uh, and, and, you know, uh, are, are you positive or negative? Many of the name makers and people who would be a name maker are mass murderers. I would say that everybody I can think of who's a mass murderer wanted to get their name out there. Uh, and we have to ask ourselves, what kind of people are these? You know, what kind of people uh, won't rest until they've killed somebody else? And often, people they don't even know. Every day of my life, I look for the salt of the earth kind of people. Let me say that again. Every day of my life, I look for the salt of earth kind of people. And I try to be a salt of the earth man myself. I try to think right. I want to do right. I want to live right. I try to do my part for the uplift of society. I want to help the children. I want to improve the lot for the poor. I want to feed the hungry, house the homeless, and make the world a better place. And I'm going to tell you, I'm not what I'm getting ready to tell you. I don't want anybody to take me up on this. But the last Sunday I was in Detroit, uh, you know, I had gotten out some cash money because the next day my wife and I were going to fly to California and see our grandchildren. I was very content. And I'm not a rich man, but, you know, I'm budgeting my money out for the trip. So I got some cash money out. I come to church, and there's a homeless man that I know who's sitting on the steps of the church with a woman and who I don't know. And they said, Reverend Hood, what are you going to do? I said, what do you mean? They said, well, we're here from out of town. We took the train here, and we don't have anywhere to stay. I, and we have no money. And I'm thinking, you know, in my head, I'm saying, well, I have a church credit card with a big name called Ex Pastor's Expense Allowance. And <laughs> I said, and the church has a place in the budget for benevolence. So I went to one hotel, the Shorecrest, and uh, that was an experience. You know, that, down here on Jefferson and Rivard, I said, I don't think we want to be there. And so we get in the car, we go a little further to the Comfort Inn, which I was surprised I'd never been at the Comfort Inn. It actually looked pretty decent. And I went in there, and I told a couple, I said, just stay in the car. I go in there, I, I meet the lady at the desk, and her manager, and he was just sitting there, and I told him what I wanted to do. I said, I want to get a room for five days. And uh, I said, I'm a pastor of a local church, and I'm going to give you my card. That's my business card. And I said, I'd like a room for two people for five days, and I want it to be tax-free. And the the manager, he perked right up. He said, maybe we will get a blessing from this. And I said, you certainly will. And so they gave me, you know, approval for this room. And I helped the couple, you know, to get their bags. And I, the man said, I have no money. And I went into my trip money. You know, I'm not a rich man. You know, I got a, a Sister Pat, you know, I was talking to you about budgeting. <laughs> I said, I'm not a rich man, but I gave that guy $100 of my trip money. And I told my wife, I said, Denise, I said, I gave away $100 of my trip money today. And I said, I hope we have enough money to, to eat. I said, because I budgeted, you know, every day in California. And she, you know, tried to make me feel better. She said, Nick, I'm sure you're going to heaven. And I said, <laughs> I said, okay. I said, we'll see. You know, but you know what? I ended the trip with more money. Yeah, so I was blessed. But the point that I'm making is I'm trying to live my life like the salt of the earth. Uh, I want to make the world a better place. Uh, I want my no to mean no. I want my yes to mean yes. Uh, I don't want to be a fake. Uh, I don't want to tolerate people who come off like a fake. And at the end of the day, when my time in this good world is up, 
I want the Lord to greet me with outstretched hands from heaven looking down as I make my way up. And I want to hear the Lord say, Nick Hood, come on up. Come on up, Nick. You did well with a little. You tried to tell the truth. You tried to live the truth. You tried to be the truth. Your no meant no. Your yes meant yes. You fed the hungry. You gave drink to the thirsty. You gave power to the weak. You gave comfort to the lonely. In your own life, you have tried to leave this world just a little better. And so come on up right now. Your time is up. Come on up. You have preached your last sermon. You have prayed your last prayer. You have sung your last song. You have played your last song. Now lay down and come on up and enter into the joy of thy salvation. My friends, that's the word I leave you with today. Come on up. Don't dwell in the gutter. Come on up. Come on up to where the air is fresh, where the sun shines continually. Come on up. Taste the fullness of the blessing of God. My friends, I open the doors of the church right now to any person without a church home. And I want you to know that I think we're almost finished with this pandemic. We got to get through the Delta variant. I want to thank the members of this church who have not insisted that we come back and meet in person until we really are sure it's safe. But for those looking at this worship service, perhaps you do not have a church home. And I want you to know that there's nothing like the sweet communion of the fellowship of believers in Jesus Christ. And I miss that at this church. I miss all the fellowship. I miss having coffee hour in between services. I miss breakfast with grits and eggs and chicken. <laughs> There's so much I miss about the church. And I don't know what kind of church will be remaining when we're finished with this. I talked to one of our members yesterday trying to get the name of another member's mother. And I called Angela Leslie. Angela told me, she said, sure, I can get you the name of the woman you're looking for. She said, but Reverend Hood, I've relocated back to Alabama. And I, all I could think of was I said, what kind of church am I going to have without Angela Leslie? You know, she used to lead with her sister Tyra the hat parade on Easter Sunday. And that's the kind of thing I wonder, what will be left of the church? But I want to plant a seed right now for those who are looking at this worship service. And I want you to ask yourself, have I ever been active in a church since I was a child in Sunday school? And I want you to think about being active in this church. That day is coming. I invite you now to join with me in prayer. Will you pray with me? O oh Lord, our God, how excellent is thy name. Before the mountains were brought forth, wherever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. O oh Lord God, I pray right now for the sick and shut in. I pray for Teresa Barmore. I pray for Ron Brundage coming out from the COVID-19. Brother Mike, who else is sick, man? I pray for Terry Conaway, recovering from brain surgery. I pray for her son, Henry Conaway, broke his right foot, and he's a drummer. I pray today for Ken Lowry, who has survived COVID-19. I pray for Harry Todd. I pray for Frances Clemens being cared for by her daughter in Ohio. Oh Lord God, I pray for the coupled people, the married and the unmarried. I pray for the lonely people. I pray
pray for the single people. I pray right now for the poor people, people who don't have enough money to live on. I pray for Sherry Dent. If you want me to pray for somebody, I got a minute. Type in their name right now. And Brother Mike is going to give me the name. Who you want me to pray for? It doesn't have to be a sick person. What Washington? Liz Washington. I'm praying for Michael Strong in Miami, Florida. Anne Marie Ice, Dr. Anne Marie Ice. A 10 year old granddaughter whose name is what? From Joe Ellen Reynolds. Gloria Jean Mitchell. Gloria Jean Mitchell. We're praying for you. Sharon Gardner. Sartan. Amen. Friends, I pray for everybody. Jewel who? Williams. Deacon Rockefeller. Amen. Viola Chandler. All right, we're going to move on. But I want you to think about chatting me the name of somebody you want me to pray for. And I want you to know I'm praying for you. I pray for the United States of America. I pray for our former president, Donald Trump. Why he can't just be supportive of the country during 9-11. I pray for all the people that follow him that they might open their eyes with an objective view to what is going on right now. I pray, O oh Lord God, for the new Afghanistan. I pray for Pakistan. I pray for India. I pray, O oh Lord God, for China right now. I pray for Turkey. I pray for Syria. I pray for Jordan. I pray for my friends in Ghana, my friends in Liberia, my friends in South Africa, my friends in Ecuador, in Chile, in Brazil. And I want you to know I'm praying for you. Oh Lord God, when we come to the end of the journey and there's nothing more we can do, I ask just one final blessing that like a thief in the night, you might reach down the long arm of your love from heaven and steal our souls back into thee. Take away this life we've come to know, the love we've come to cherish. And on that last day, redeem us of our sins. Grant us life everlasting. Amen. Brother Mike, can you hand me the offerings for today, man? Huh? My friends, uh, let me just say that we are in a pandemic, but even though we're in a pandemic, we've got to function as a church. And I want to think this is the Saturday offering and one more day this week when I stop by the church. And I want to thank the United States Postal Service. Uh, Brother Mike, I thank you for telling our postal carrier that I'm praying for her. I'm praying for her every week. And I hear so many bad things about the Postal Service, but I want you to know something. The Postal Service has been very good to the Plymouth United Church of Christ. <laughs> but it wouldn't be good for the church if the church wasn't good to the church. And so I invite you now to repeat with me the words of Jesus. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. Amen. I'd like to invite now Dr. Ella Davis to lead us in the reading, the recitation 
of the United Church of Christ Statement of Faith. And as Dr. Davis recites our Statement of Faith, I want you to listen very, very carefully to what she's saying, particularly people who are not members of the church. Listen carefully because what she's going to break down in a simple fashion is what we believe about God, what we believe about Jesus, what we believe about the Holy Spirit. And if you think you could be comfortable in a church like this, <clears throat> I want you to think about joining the church. I present to you now Dr. Ella Davis. Good morning, and thank you, Reverend Hood. Please join with me uh, in the reading of the Statement of Faith. We believe in God, the eternal spirit, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and our Father, and to his deeds we testify. He calls the world into being, creates man in his own image, and sets before him the ways of life and death. He seeks in holy love to save all people from aimlessness and sin. He judges men and nations by his righteous will, declared through prophets and apostles. In Jesus Christ, the man of Nazareth, our crucified and risen Lord. He has come to us and shared our common lot, conquering sin and death, and reconciling the world to himself. He bestows upon us his Holy Spirit, creating and renewing the Church of Jesus Christ, binding in his covenant faithful people of all ages, tongues, and races. He calls us into his church to accept the cost and joy of discipleship, to be his service in the service of men, to proclaim the gospel to all the world and resist the powers of evil, to share in Christ's baptism and eat at his table, to join him in his passion and victory. He promises to all who trust him forgiveness of sins and fullness of grace, courage in the struggle for justice and peace, his presence in trial and rejoicing, and eternal life in his kingdom which has no end. Blessing and honor, glory and power be unto him. Amen. Praise God from whom blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him.
Amen. 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 Again, we're about ready to close service, uh, but I just want to say uh, before the benediction how happy I am to see our bass player back with us today, Ibrahim Jones. And uh, <laughs> Brother Ibrahim is starting to travel with the spinners, the world famous spinners. And I mentioned last week, I said, you know, Ibrahim, your blessing is my nightmare that one day you're just going to fly away. Uh, but you know something? Life is that way. And the time to fly away is when you're young. Amen? And so, Ibrahim, and to the rest of you, I say, take advantage of every opportunity. And I want you to know I'm praying for you. My friends, as we uh, prepare to leave this place, let me say goodbye to Sheila Odin, our organist. Let me say goodbye to Jerome Clark, the guitar player. Let me say goodbye to Jason Johnson, playing so strong on the drums. Amen. And to this gospel choir, the Plymouth United Church of Christ, I leave you with this blessing. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. The rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and grant you peace, both now and forevermore. Amen.